Hello, marketer, and welcome to another episode of Lean Mean Marketing Teams. This week, we are joined by Rosemary Martin, Chief Customer Officer at Flybys. Rosemary has over 15 years of marketing commercial experience, spanning a range of industries and brands such as Publicis Mojo, London Business School, and ANZ Bank before joining Coles in relaunching the Flybys program in 2012. As Chief Customer Officer for Flybys, Rosemary brings a deep understanding of customers to the broader business to inform strategy and decision making. Flybys is consistently rated by customers as Australia's most popular loyalty program, with over two thirds of Australians active in the program, 20 coalition partners, and fun fact, they send over one billion emails per year. This was a particularly enjoyable episode for me. I got to catch up with an ex-colleague that I've always had huge respect for, and it was just so nice to learn from Rosemary after such a long time and hear about the amazing work she's been doing with her team at Flybys. In this jam-packed episode, we cover how Rosemary has built out her CX function and what is in her portfolio, the CX and marketing transformation journey that Rosemary has been leading, including the results from a deep segmentation study and how customer insights and underpinning the strategy at Flybars, the move to agile product delivery teams and how the marketing team has adopted new agile ways of working, and some of the pros, cons and challenges associated with this. The two-way benefits that flow when marketing starts working really closely with the tech teams, the importance of internal comms and strong change management when implementing new ways of working. And a big topic was how to build rock solid relationships and create trust, respect and alignment with your executive counterparts like the Chief Technology Officer and Chief Product Officer. I think this section in particular is packed with gold as I believe CX is a team sport and it's absolutely essential for all functions to work together to deliver an amazing customer experience. Lastly, but by no means least, we talk about how to be proactive and strategic about data management and personalization in a constantly changing landscape by putting the customer's best interests first. So as you can tell, there is a lot covered in this episode. And if you're like me, you want to put into action some of what you learn from podcasts, make sure you download the notes from this episode. Dylan on our team listens back to the show and writes summary notes packed with all the insights and strategies. Just go to our website, growthgenerators.io, head to the podcast section, look out for this episode and download those notes. Now let's get into the show. Welcome to Lean Mean Marketing Teams with Ty Hayes where you'll hear from CMOs, authors and experts at the top of their game to learn how to create a modern, high-performance marketing team. If you enjoy this episode, please remember to hit subscribe so that you can be the first in line to hear each new episode as it drops. Now, let's get into the show. Rosemary Martin, Chief Customer Officer of Flybys, welcome to the Lean Mean Marketing Teams podcast. Thank you so much for having me. And we met uh, many years ago back in London Business School, worked together there and launched new programs to the world and helped our LBS enter new markets. And yeah, I've always admired your strategic data-driven approach and it's so nice to catch up again. I can't wait to hear about what you've been up to since. Thank you. I'm really excited to, um, to be here and have this chat. And I know you mentioned that we've worked together, but the truth is I worked for you. So <laughs> you were my esteemed uh, manager at the time. So mm. I learned a lot from you in my time there as well. So <laughs> Thank you. Well, I think I'm going to learn a lot from you today and I'm looking forward to it. Now, um, can you perhaps take us back to when your passion for marketing started and give us a brief summary of your career today? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, to be honest, I think I sort of just, fell into, into marketing. So I was doing a commerce degree at, um, at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And I, I think as I was sort of going through and you do a range of different courses and the ones that I loved the most were all of those great sort of psychology courses and the ones that had a psychological aspect to them. I've always been really interested in people and, and human behaviour. And I think um, from there, I was, I was going through my degree, the more I learned about um marketing the more I realized that um, it's something that actually covers every spectrum of of business so you know whether that's from the value proposition or product design through to the kind of um, commercials and pricing and also you know just creating a connection um, and engaging with customers directly and so I think from there that just sort of flowed um, through when I completed my degree in marketing and then just sort of commenced my career down that track. I remember the same. I love those consumer behaviour units at, um, in the marketing course and HR was my other um, the, the minor or degree. And yeah, I love those combinations of consumer behaviour and psychology and 
and all those good things. Now, um, Flyblyers, you've been there for quite a while, and obviously that's a household brand in Australia, with, as I understand it, about two thirds of Australians as members. But for the benefit of our global audience, can you tell them a little bit more about Flybys? Yeah, sure. So Flybys has um, been around in Australia for, for more than 25 years now, and it's um, Australia is probably um, original and, and most popular loyalty program. You know, as you mentioned, we have more than two thirds of Australian households actually active in the, the program, so actively um, collecting points and. Um, our members have the opportunity to earn from a, a real coalition of, um, of partners, including, um, you know, uh, anything from coal supermarkets through to liquor, so liquor land. Um, you can earn points with fuel, um, homewares and, and Kmart, and even through to then utilities such as energy or, or health insurance with HCF. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really kind of um, broad and diverse um program and then on top of that um, Flybase has a, a couple of uh, I guess key digital touch points with consumers being our, our website and our, our app so there's a few million um, customers engaging with those on a regular basis and then we also send out more than a billion um, personalised emails each year um, as well and they those emails um, I guess we do a lot to make sure that there is personalised and relevant as they can be to maintain sort of those um, world-leading engagement rates that we see as well. Brilliant. Yeah, well, no shorter of data and personalisation and segmentation, so I'm sure we're going to dive into some of that um, throughout this interview. And now you've been with Flybys in some form or another. You were with Coles for quite a while and have been on projects as when Flybys kind of became its standalone entity and then most recently promoted to Chief Customer Officer. Can you tell us a bit about the marketing transformation journey you've been on over this time, perhaps the last yeah, few years? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I joined Flybys at a time um, when Coles supermarkets had just bought out the, the program and they relaunched it, literally sending out a sort of membership card to every household um, in Australia. Um, which was a, a really exciting time in the first sort of build out of the program as a coalition. And then, yeah, more recently in the last couple of years, Wes Farmers and Coles um, set up Flybys as an independent joint venture. So 50-50 owned between both of those um, shareholders. And that sort of marked a, a real point of transformation for us as a, a business and it's actually pretty incredible when I step back and think about it in terms of just the amount of change um, that that heralded in terms of you know not just a new ownership structure but um, a new leadership team and um, team structure new strategy um, new technology so we've been fortunate enough to to re-platform the entire um, business in the last couple of years as well and as you might imagine um, with a 25 year old program came about 25 years of tech legacy as well to, to sort of work on um, you know often it was all held together with band-aids and sticky tape um, and then also even um, things such as you know moving to a new office and out of um, cold which has really been our parent for, for such a long time and I think in terms of the, the marketing transformation more specifically as well that meant that um, we needed to kind of reassess and realign um, our marketing, um, our own marketing strategy to align to the, the strategy of the, the new strategy of our business. We needed to look at new ways of, um, of working to align with this new sort of structure that we had as a, a business, um, looking at how we integrated with all this new technology. Um, and then also just even things like how do we go about putting in place um, a creative agency that is the best fit for us as a, I guess, a smallish digital business, you'd say, rather than a really large scale retailer. So, um, yeah, there were a lot of kind of challenges and opportunities for us to, um, to work through in the last couple of years. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds in incredible. And your role then as Chief Customer Officer, what... Yeah, which parts of um, those elements have you tackled head on over the past couple of years and, and yeah, how's the team kind of changed um, during that time? Yeah, sure. So, look, in the past uh, two to three years that I've had marketing in my portfolio, I guess my role has changed um, quite a bit as the needs of the business have shifted. So, at, at various times I've had, um, you know, 
product um, and analytics and digital in my portfolio. And um, I guess fast forwarding to current day, the, the role um, that I play is everything to do with customer experience. So um, making sure I've had to build up CX as a, a function from scratch and making sure that we're embedding um, customer centricity across our um, our business and that all key decisions are, are under, underpinned by customer and sudden experience. Um, and then through to um, the marketing uh, uh, side of things. So we've got a, um, a brand and digital team. So that team looks after all of our um, brand and media, as well as we have an in-house design um, studio. So if you think about those 1 billion emails that I mentioned before, we, um, you know, we build all of those um, in-house and looking after all our digital marketing as well um, and PR. And then also um, on the other side of the marketing um, team as well, I've got um, a team of people that look after all of our, our life cycle activities. So I guess thinking of um, our program life cycle and making sure that we're getting the right program um, comes to people at the, the right time, as well as all our go to market activities. So, um, you know, with a coalition of more than 20 partners, I guess we're always looking for more partners to bring into the mix. We're also looking at, um, I guess, extending into new products and services as, as well. And so the team look after um, all of the marketing to, to support products and, and the partners we bring on board too. Yeah, sounds like a really interesting portfolio. Um, how big is it now compared to what it was? Uh, the team now is about 20, um, split across CX and marketing. And I think when we when I had analytics as well, it was probably closer to around 50 um, or so. So we've got a fairly large team of analysts too. Um, so yeah, it's really been, it's, it's fluctuated, but certainly in terms of the, the marketing component, um, I'd say the team's been relatively stable. We are um, we are sort of growing incrementally over time as we're growing as a, a business, um, but most of the growth has been probably in the um, CX side of things and then also in terms of product marketing and um, the needs to support that area of the business, which is um, a new one for us. Yeah. yeah. And how did you go about um, building out that CX team? Did you have challenges finding the right talent in the market? Yeah, so um, at the time of the, the merger, we were leveraging um, Coles to provide a range of services um, for us. So a lot of those were support services like um, legal and HR, but we also used their human-centered design team um, for some of our activity as well. And I was lucky enough that um, someone from that Coles team came across and, and joined us um, permanently in, in flybys. And then she's been instrumental really in, um, in looking to grow that team. It's currently, it's still small. It's a team of um, three today. And then we also augment that um, with outsourced um, resources project by project. If we um, are seeing kind of we, we need to um, flex a little bit or if there's a bit mm. of a bottleneck in terms of mm. the, the demand. Yeah, and I understand yeah. you, you did quite a large study recently into your segment, you know, deep segmentation study and looking at, yeah, your, your better understanding of your customers. Do you want to talk a little bit about, about that? Yeah, definitely. So that was a, a, a really um, large scale piece of work and actually quite a significant financial investment from from the business as well, and really was just a recognition that um, we had quite sophisticated um, segmentations or understanding of customers through the lens of a partner um, that may have been part of the program. So for example, Coles will have very sophisticated um, segments based on how people are transacting with Coles, but we had um, quite limited sort of holistic um, view of, pro, uh, of our customers in terms of our members, in terms of the way that they are engaging with the, the program. So we, we undertook to develop a, a segmentation of some um, personas at a sort of holistic program level to help us understand, you know, are there different cohorts of, 
of members and you know how and why do they choose to engage with us as a program so that sort of started out as a, a data exploration piece in terms of understanding all the different um, data sets across partners and, and about our members that we had available and then from there we sort of augmented that um, identified where there were gaps and what we not, might know about a, um, a particular cohort of, of members and went out with a a survey an online survey to people just in terms of understanding things like um, attitudes towards saving or you know at a category level where were they spending their money um, each month to give a better sense of spend outside of the flybys ecosystem as well um, and then the final sort of piece in the puzzle was once we had sort of crystallized that there were actually you know five um, fairly distinct groups of members uh, within flybys, we went out and did some in-depth um, focus group research to really sort of understand the, the why a lot more in terms of the, I guess the, you know, why they were choosing to engage with flybys, what they were looking to, um, to get out of the program and um, just understand a little bit more about the different ways in which they were um, engaging with us just to get that really rich sort of level of information too. And I think, um, What's really important through this exercise is that it hasn't just been um, some kind of academic exercise to develop these segments and then create some posters and stick them on the wall and you know refer to them in meetings. It's actually um, they underpin a lot of um, you know the product development decisions that we might make now or um, underpin a lot of the targeting and I actually leverage um, not just by the customer team, but by the various teams around the, the business as well. And that was really important um, and something that we really tried to drive home was that it needed to be, um, these segments needed to be actionable, um, at, you know, rather than just a theoretical exercise. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we've all seen the personas on the walls and, you know, had meetings <laughs> where we refer to Jane or, you know, Luke or Amira or whatever it is. But, yeah, when you can actually build in into your... Uh, marketing approach your targeting um, is where the value really lies and when it's adopted across the business shows that it's solving the right problems and providing the right insights so well done now I'd love to shift gears a bit here and um, understand you've had a bit of a shift to agile and product delivery teams and a new way of working at flybys can you talk to us a bit about that journey yeah absolutely and, and that's been probably one of the biggest changes um, within our, our business that we've seen in the last couple of years which has been um, spinning up a product function and moving towards this concept of, um, I guess, not just working in an agile um, environment, but um, developing these sort of continuous roadmaps where we can um, pivot and have shifting priorities rather than, I guess, spinning up um, a project team around a specific um, and distinct project. So you're constantly kind of just... Um, yeah, so moving towards the concept, I guess, of having consistent teams in place that will that will work through things. And um, yeah, that was quite a big shift for our business. And there was a, so we brought in a chief product um, officer, Harley Giles, who's, who's fantastic. And I guess one of the first things that he really needed to focus on was educating the entire business around, you know, what product does. Um, why it's important, the value it can bring to the business and just more broadly how it will all work. And it was quite a, a different, con you know, we were used to very much a waterfall style way of, um, of working. And it's been really interesting, I think, um, too, because this product development process um, is still focused mostly around uh, new initiatives and um, new innovation. And we still have um, an area of the business, um, which I guess I could refer to as our BAU, but you know, a lot of them, um, the more day-to-day -day sending of personalized offers out to customers, leveraging existing tech and processes, that sort of has remained untouched. And it's an interesting juncture we're at now in terms of um, finding our way and, and do the two intersect yeah. or, how, you, you know, how does that yeah. work? together and as a marketing team it's been um interesting too in terms of understanding how to adapt to work with the product way of working but then we also mm. have um a, a standard um, yeah. way of working over yeah. here for something else yeah it's a perennial challenge the two speed and 
you know, often the product teams or the agile squads come in and they start operating in a new way and delivering value really quickly in those sprints and sprint planning and reviews. And, and then, yeah, sometimes the BAU, there's always going to be the BAU work, but I think it's often how can they embrace some of the principles of agile or, or adapt some different ways of working. Kanban sometimes works quite well for the BAU work where the work can still be incremental and come in and be repetitive, but you're not working in fixed sprints with fixed delivery goals. But it's an evolution, isn't it? You start and you see the rewards of, of the new way of working and then you continue to evolve your model to, to be the most effective for all the different teams. But in terms of the actual marketing team, then how, how does that work? Are they on squads with the product team and they, you know, work in sprints or work with them to deliver certain initiatives over time? So the way it sort of works has been, um, it's different in the CX space. So they're very much embedded in the discovery process and, um, and, and work in sprints alongside the tech team in terms of, um, as we're going through the experience design process, sort of testing with customers, iterating, making sure it aligns with um, architecture and the, the engineers um, before we then go into build. So that sort of side of things is integrated quite neatly, I would say. Um, it's obviously not without its teething issues, but, um, but, but, but yes, they're working very much on a kind of sprint cycle. And even in terms of their work that doesn't align to product and might be supporting the rest of the business, um, that sort of move to a sprint cycle as well because it makes sense to have it all together. Um, and then in a in a marketing capacity, um, we have um, members of the team that will be working on um, a particular go to market uh, piece, and they will usually go on the journey in terms of making sure that um, they're getting the findings from the. Um, the research or the experience design work that's done and that's feeding into therefore their marketing planning and they do tend to um, attend the kind of fortnightly um, sessions but I don't believe they're in the daily stand-ups or, or anything like that and I've been a, a, I think a bit of a challenge to figure out what's the best way for marketing to work because I guess the nature of what you're doing is um, you still tend to you know you need to deliver um, certain yeah, pieces by a particular fine. date and you're kind of working through that with the agency in parallel um, but it's but certainly some of the I think some of the biggest challenges we've had have been around communication and just things changing potentially around a launch date or um, in terms of even the nature of a, a product pivoting that slightly and um, there being a bit of a communication gap between it and the marketing <laughs> Team. So I think we still have a little way to go in terms of just ironing out and making sure that we're fully integrated yeah. into the process. Yeah, yeah, it's complex, isn't it? When yeah, you usually have waterfall dates or hard deadlines, but the product may be shifting, and then sprints and priorities constantly changing. It's such a different way of working. Yeah, what, definitely. What have been um, some of the pros or cons you've seen from that new way of working? Yeah, so I would definitely say in terms of the pros what I think has worked really well is um, is our quarterly planning process so just getting a lot more robust in terms of um, you know leadership team aligning on you know yes these are the priorities for the quarter these are the things that the teams are going to be working um, to and then the you know the delivery teams coming back and saying well based on the jigsaw puzzle that we've looked at, this is the way that things are aligning for the quarter. And I think um, having that level of, um, it sounds ridiculous because it's only a quarter, but for us having even that level of planning has been really helpful from a marketing um, perspective, just to have a bit more, I think, greater insight and, and a better level of detail into how things are running that, that next quarter. So that's worked really well. I think it's actually got us all more aligned and, um, dare I say, it, a bit more organised. Um, and then I think also just by virtue of um, marketers getting closer to a tech team, I think there's so much value that can be derived from that in terms of just sparking um, new ideas or a greater understanding of um, the art of what might be possible. 
um, and how how that can be leveraged for sort of future campaign activity or um, yeah future um, things that we might want to do in, in marketing as well. So that's probably been another um, benefit too is just um, you know working more closely than traditionally we might have in the past. Yeah. And it, the benefit flows both ways, doesn't it? Because the marketing team will have deep customer insights into problems that may need to be solved or value propositions and product and tech team know, you know, what the technology might be able to deliver and what the roadmap is. But when you get those two teams working really closely together, feeding insights into each other and collaborating and brainstorming and breaking down silos, the, yeah, the outcomes can be tremendous. Yeah, that's a really great point. And I think, you know, as we have continued to um, mature as a, as a um, business with a, a product um, and delivery function, I think um, we've become a lot, uh, there's a lot more rigor now behind the customer insights that are being brought um, to the business to drive a lot of that business decisioning as well. And um, in the past, a decision might have been made by the um, commercial team or even by the tech team in terms of, well, this is the easiest way to build it or the, you know, the quickest way to get it to market. Whereas now everything is really, it goes through the proper sort of discovery process. It needs to be underpinned by, um, you know, by true customer insight. And I think that's been a really great thing too in terms of having the confidence that what you're bringing to market is the right thing um, and the right thing for the customer. Yeah. And it's um, basic, but it's hard. Of, <laughs> but it isn't. It's hard. And, you know, yeah. it's whether a company is product focused or customer focused and how those two areas work together. And with a new product function setting up as well, it sounds like you've you know, crack the nut pretty early and making sure it's customer driven and marketing working with the product team to ensure that. So that sounds good. Are there any other critical safeguards or strategies you think they'll put in place to make that implementation successful? Uh, yeah, so something um, at the same time as introducing uh, this way of working, we also introduced a change management team as well. And I think that um, in hindsight has been quite valuable in terms of just making sure that nothing is missed when you're all off running, just, you know, bringing things to market and doing things differently. Um, probably just having people with an eye on that change and even just with respect to kind of internal um, comms and how it gets communicated around your business. Um, as well as just fully assessing and thinking through the impact of the, the changes that you're proposing. I think that's been um, something quite valuable for us, just in terms of it is a bit of a safeguard and ensuring nothing gets missed. There are people there actually kind of laser focused on, on that while everyone else is, is getting on with things. Um, and then also I think critical for us too was just that education piece and, you know, doing that, big roadshow and just helping take people on the, the journey of that way of working um, and getting everyone kind of on the bus. I think that yeah. was a really big part of it too. Yeah, that sounds key. It is a big change for people and, you know, especially if they're used to an old way of working and waterfall and suddenly working in sprints and agile and different teams and different levels of accountability and authority, not just a line manager, you know, directing what you're going to do, but you're in an autonomous team working together. Some people adopt to it really quickly, those with a growth mindset and those that love that way of working, but for some they may be a little bit fearful and go through the whole Kubler-Ross change curve. So it sounds like you yeah, covered the bases with that change management and internal comms as well as the roadshow. Um, to, so I, I imagine was why are we doing this and how can this benefit us and what does it look like, you know, covering those bases? So. Yeah, and just being clear to people too, especially to your point around people not really um, necessarily being on board with change, but if things have always been done a certain way, it can be frustrating for people not understanding how to get things done anymore. And what do you mean I need to write a lean canvas or this is, you know, what is this all about? So I think... Um, just making sure that people are really clear on what the process is and um, actually it should make their lives easier and they should be clearer on how to get something prioritised and how to get it delivered. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's quite important too. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> wow, there's been a lot covered in this interview so far. 
As a marketing leader, we know you like to spend more time taking action and less time taking notes. So we've got you covered. We packaged up all the tips, strategies and resources from each episode into some beautifully crafted notes just for you. Not ugly AI generated transcripts, but real notes taken by a real person on our team. To grab the notes, head on over to growthgenerators.io. Look out for this podcast episode and download the notes, but be quick. They're only live for a few weeks after the episode airs. Now, back to the show. Now, uh, adopting a new operating model like this requires collaboration and strong relationships, especially with the CTO and CPO. Um, How did you go about building and strengthening those relationships and and how do they look at the moment? Yeah, you're spot on. So I think those are two of the the most critical relationships um, for me and the business. So um, really, I think I've been fortunate that um, our leadership team was, you know, um, established as we had a new CEO come into the business and there was sort of maybe half of us that had been in the business and half of us were new and we spent a while really um, forming as a team and and we had the opportunity really to develop the strategy for our business together as well. And so what that meant is that we were all very aligned and on the same page in terms of you know um what do we want to be as a a business what's our beacon on the hill and what are the right um things that we need to do to to get us there and so i think just having that strategic alignment was really the the first step to making sure that we had a really good um way of working and collaborating and that's not to say that we agree all all the time but i think you know ultimately um, yeah, knowing that we're all moving in the, the same direction is good. And then I think it's just, it's all been based on building a really strong kind of foundation of respect and having that healthy tension at times, um, you know, in order to deliver the best outcomes. And um, I think, you know, I'm reliant on the CTO and the CPO to, you um, to deliver on things that um, our customers want and that are the right thing for the the customer and equally. So I I kind of need to respect that um, they know they're the experts in their space and equally they need to sort of respect that I'm trying to bring the voice of the customer and bring what's best for the the customer to the business as well. And so I think um, just having that that really high level of of respect and making sure that we've kind of got each other's back has been really important. And um, it's even just simple things like the, um, so the chief product officer and I will quite often, you know, have a call over a, a drink on a Friday after work and just reflect on the week that that was and things. And I think, um, yeah, that, that's been really valuable to me. And I just, um, I don't know, it just means you can kind of go on and get things done. And if they tell you something's not possible for a, a reason, you, you you know, you really, um, you respect that and you just sort of then work together to find another another way. So, yeah, it's been, um, I feel blessed actually that I've, I've been able to, to build those um, relationships. And I think that is going to be really critical to be effective as a, a marketer moving forward to, to have those. Yeah, absolutely. And you fundamentally reliant on each other and to deliver the right customer experience. You can't, you know, neither team can do that on their own. And I think they're developing the strategy together. Obviously everyone's engaged and bought in. You've all got clarity around where we're heading and, and whose responsibility and accountable for what. And then your other points reminded me of Lencioni's um, five, you know, functions of a high performing team or dysfunctions, however you want to look at it. But, <laughs> you know, the the Bottom layer is trust and respect. And if you don't have that, then you can't go to the next level, which is healthy conflict, because you, there will be disagreements and conflict is actually a good thing because it means you fully tackle an issue and come to a better outcome, usually than if people just, you know, apathetic or, you know, um, have conflict outside of the room or behind, you know, behind backs or, you know, passively aggressive. It's much better when there's open trust and open conflict. Absolutely. I think it's been important for us as well to, take each other on the the journey with our respective areas too so for example um we recently undertook a a really major 
our brand repositioning, which is a significant departure from where our brand is today. And that's, it, it's been, a, to be honest, about a two year journey. And I've taken all of the leadership team on that journey. And there have been times when they might not have um, liked the creative put in front of them or, 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 or you know, question why would we be doing that but at the end of the day and taking them through that journey I feel like we've iterated it and got it to a place where a it's been the, the strongest it could possibly be and b um I know that I have the full backing of the leadership team behind me and that's enabled me to actually probably be a little bit more bold in the choices that I've made as well because I feel like it's been a, a, a really unanimous kind of joint piece of work that that we've that we've worked on together so um, we've kind of, I guess we applied that sort of a bit to the way I might work with the CPO and the CTO in their space in terms of if we're looking at bringing a new um, product or proposition to market, um, all of us will usually be in there meeting with vendors, understanding what it is that they could potentially be bringing to that, that proposition and we sort of um, all go on the journey together. Yeah. So important because that builds shared understanding. And without that, it's easy to criticize an outcome or an ad or something if you don't understand the context or you haven't been been part of it. But to be through the journey and you get your checks and balances and your feedback along the way, then there's no surprises at the end. And it allows for that that risk taking, you know, I've seen it. Um, give a flybys campaign, you know, and it it's you know, for uh, for some companies that would be quite risky, but obviously you've got the trust, it's aligned to the strategy and you've been able to execute that. And that requires trust um, across the colleagues, um, from the colleagues and from the CEO down. So well done on that. Now, lastly, I'd love to switch gears again to talk about data and personalization. Obviously, um, data management and personalization are key to flybys. You've got, as I understand it, close to 9 million kind of active members, as you mentioned earlier, um, number of different partners. You've got a billion emails, you mentioned, so no shortage of data at your fingertips, but with so many partners and customer segments and the changing landscape as it pertains to data privacy. I imagine it must be an ongoing challenge to work within regulations and policies while still offering a personalised experience for customers. So with that kind of context and framing, talk to us about how, how you've approached data and personalisation of flybys. Kind of where did you start and what's your strategy there? Yeah, sure. So I think um, where you start is we come from a place where our member trust and the trust that they put in us to share their data because it is their data with us is absolutely paramount and if we were to break or lose that trust somehow then I, I just think you know really we would cease to to exist and so that ethos um, is, is really the starting point and from there um, you know all of our sort of privacy policies, the terms and conditions that we apply, the processes that we set up in terms of, um, so we have a, a weekly governance um, forum, which is actually attended by um, a representative from each function across the, the business, not the not necessarily the leadership team, but from people across the, you know, I, I think we all, um, just to make sure that whatever we're, whichever way we're proposing to use our member, data to, to drive that personalization that it is you know um, an appropriate use that will be acceptable to our members not just within the bounds of terms and conditions or privacy legislation but is this something that members would feel okay about um, our, our chief operating officer um, who also is our privacy officer always like to say you know would that pass the sniff test for a, yeah. <laughs> for a member and um, yeah. you know I guess um, that sort of all, you know, sort of all stems from that ethos, and then you kind of set up these um, these processes or systems ar around that to make sure that, um, I guess, a that everyone um, buys into that ethos and is living and breathing it, no matter if they're a, um, you know, a data engineer or a marketer or whoever they might be in the business, that they understand that. Um, you know that 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 member trust in the way we use um, data needs to kind of be be done appropriately. But then also, yeah, just making sure you have the right frameworks and things um, in place. So that's sort of where I think we start, and then it's really um, evolved over time too. So with 
uh, GDPR, you know, and the European legislations, which I, I guess were the first and probably the most stringent around, um, you know, how customer data can be or, or can't be used and, and shared. I think we, um, we in the Australian market haven't gone that far, but for us as a business, it's been important to probably explore with customers um, is what we're doing today enough? Is it clear enough? Um, on a spectrum, if we were to move towards GDPR from a legis uh, legislative perspective, um, what would that look and feel like to a member and, and what would they kind of expect to see from us and what from us? So we actually have actively gone out and done research in that space as well, I guess, to, to start to future-proof um, that sort of thing. And then my also, also my observation would be that Quite often, so we take quite a conservative view, I think, in terms of um, what we would do with and what we won't do with, with customer data. And quite often it comes out in the research that members probably think that we're doing more with their data than what we actually yeah. are. Yeah. And the truth is, if they trust you as a brand, they're okay with that. You know, and if, if they find the purpose okay, then... Um, then they're sorry. Then they're comfortable. So I, I think that's um, yeah, that's something that we're a little bit mindful mindful of as well. But uh, I guess from a customer perspective, they give us um, they trust us with their data, and they expect us to use it to give them highly relevant and personalised experiences. And if we don't do that, um, that's when we get into trouble. So you know, people don't want to receive a cat food offer if they don't have a cat. Um, and, and even if we're not directly asking them that, they expect us to know that. So, yeah, so it's a bit of a balancing act between, you, you know, using the data in an appropriate way and not getting too scary, um, but equally delivering value um, to a customer, you know, through that personalisation. Yeah. And it seems to be, I mean, there seems to be a rising awareness um, and focus on data privacy, you know, with iOS 14. Um, blocking some or at least being an opt-in for um, tracking across apps and obviously Safari and Firefox, stopping third-party cookies and Google um, agreeing to do that at some point in the future. But, so to get this balance of personalization and data governance, it's going to become increasingly challenging. It sounds like you tackled it the right way, starting at what, what's best for the customer and the governance across the business, you know, it doesn't rest on the data privacy officer. It's up to you, mate. You know, you got to look after this for the whole business. It's, it's everyone and building that awareness. But I imagine your platform, like replatforming, have you kind of future-proofed that or how have you gone about that because obviously all these changes to privacy change, is changing the landscape. So I would like to think that yes we have future proofed <laughs> that but, future but proof. I think the yeah I think the reality is that um, you don't sort of just build something and then it works from day one. So for us we had um, you know data sitting in different spots and, and a core part of our replatforming was to bring all that data into a single area but that doesn't mean you can just lift and shift data models or you know so it's been a really um for me anyway it's been a, a, a bigger process than I think I could have um or a bigger journey than I, I could have originally anticipated so I think there's the technology might be future proof but I think um there's still work to, to do for us to fully extract the value of, of what we've invested in. Yeah, makes sense. That's probably a topic for an entire episode around that. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> yeah, so we are conscious of time. Um, yeah, before we get into the fast five, what are you most excited about in the future there or what are you working next in terms of building and leading a modern marketing team? Yeah, time? so look, I'm most excited about... Um, all of the new uh, products and propositions and digital experiences that we're going to be bringing to market in the next um, 12 months or so. So really for us as a business, when we, um, when we were established independently and went through this big replatforming, it kind of meant that everything changed behind the curtain, but for a, a customer, nothing changed at all. And it doesn't feel like we've brought much true innovation to the market um, 
in the last year or two. So I'm really excited about, you know, now that we have a platform in place, we can start to build a whole bunch of exciting products and features on top of it. And that's, that's what I'm really excited about is, um, is being able to deliver some of that innovation to customers. So watch the space. Yeah, sounds exciting. <laughs> Staying tuned for more on that. That's right. Well, Ro, uh, thanks for the main body of the interview there. We've covered a lot about your journey, the customer experience and um, amazing work you're doing with the team, how you've rolled out the product um, data teams, the importance of the relationships with the CT on CPO. So a lot of ground covered there. Um, but we are now ready for our fast five, if you're ready. I'm ready. Okay. so. What do you believe are three essential capabilities or criteria of a high performance marketing team? Right, I'd say firstly, making sure that as a team you're, you, you have really clear and aligned goals. So you're all sort of clear on everyone, you know, needs to understand and buy into the, the strategy and understand what we're trying to achieve. Uh, secondly, I think um, diversity of thought. So, it's my observation over the years that to achieve the best sort of outcome, you need people um, approaching things from different angles um, just to that yield sort of the best and most creative results. And then I think thirdly, um, and it's only become more apparent in, in the recent um, year or so, is probably just a team that's flexible and adaptable to change. So I think we've all experienced that. <laughs> Um, recently with with COVID, but just being able to to be able to, um, I would say, adapt at pace is, is pretty important too. Yeah. I'd agree with all of those. And um, how would you describe your marketing team's culture in one word? Uh, collaborative. So I think to get anything out the door in our business, um, you know, we need to work um, both across our own team, but also all the various um, areas of our, our business as well. So yeah, collaboration. Yeah. Right, good. And what's one skill or capability you've learned recently that you wish you'd developed much sooner in your career? It's probably knowing when to give and, and when to stand your ground. I think sometimes you just need to learn to let things go or to accept that that you're not going to get the outcome that you wanted and then there are times when you 100 percent should be sticking to your guns because you know it's the right thing for the customer and it will not work if, if they don't get that right and i think that's something that you just get over the years through experience uh, if you have a few wins and a few fails yeah <laughs> and you sort of figure out um and learn over time learned isn't it it's kind of a mix of confidence and intuition yeah, and experience yeah. <laughs> to know to know yeah when to give and when to stand your ground yeah. it's very contextual and what book or books have you read that you found yourself recommending to others or that you think our audience would gain value from oh well to be honest Ty with two young kids most of the books <laughs> I read are bedtime stories <laughs> <laughs> they but, can be quite informative yeah, but, but I would say um probably one that that brings to mind is one that um that my CEO gave me to, to read, which was um, Misbehaving by Richard um, Thaler. And it's all about the emergence of behavioural economics. So if you're interested in psychology and things, that would definitely speak to you. But it was just fascinating in terms of, um, you know, you have economics as a, a field and just the fact that humans are not rational and do not always behave as you would expect them to and, and therefore kind of these economic models don't always predict the, the, the right results and I think there's a lot of learnings in there that can be applied to um, to modern day marketing so that's probably one I'd recommend. Yeah, absolutely I haven't read that one yet but I've read Thinking Fast and Slow which can be uh, yeah, yeah. with a lot of that behavioral economics yeah. and yeah, yeah they definitely um, debunk the whole economics as a theory sometimes but definitely and um, you question your own judgments yeah yeah i'm <laughs> not, I'm not purely too. rational yeah. Come on, I'm, yeah. i buy emotionally what's this yeah <laughs> um, yeah fascinating well rose so nice to catch up again after many years thank you for coming on the show and i hope that we stay in touch thank you so much for having me ty it's been an absolute pleasure Thanks so much for listening to Lean Mean Marketing Teams with Ty Hayes. This podcast is brought to you by Growth Generators, a consulting firm that helps CMOs design and build modern marketing teams that drive growth. If you need help optimizing your marketing team, head to growthgenerators.io.